Today, I want to talk to you from these words. But what if he doesn't? What if he doesn't? Because we often hear these words. Won't he do it? Yeah, and people want to go shouting and say, yeah, won't he do it? Because they'll remember something that God uh, has done for them either recently or sometime in the past or what have you. And they say, won't he do it? And we typically don't say it until we have something to say or until God does it, right? And we say, won't he do it? But here's the message I want to talk to you today is, but what if he doesn't? There's some application questions um, that I want to just kind of lead off with before we go into the, the message. What do you do when God, who can, won't? And have you ever allowed the silence of God or unanswered prayers deter you from worshiping God? And then, how do you define grace and favor? Give you an opportunity to soak that in. If you want to screenshot it, that's up to you as well. But I want to call your attention to Daniel, the third chapter, the 17th and 18th verse. Now, this is going to sound like a lot of verses. But it's a total of about 10. I'm going to go through three separate parts of the Bible. Daniel 3, 17 and 18 is where we're going to go first. And then 2 Samuel 12, 16, 18, 20, and 22. And then 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Again, sounds like a lot, but it's only 10 verses. But um, I want to present two two scenarios from Scripture. as the foundation to our message. The three Hebrew boys and King David, who the Bible says is a man after what? God's own heart. So let's read Daniel 3, 17 and 18. And it reads, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve, is able to save us. How many of you know about the ableness of God? He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But here's the 18th verse. But even if he doesn't, oh, I feel like preaching today. We want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. The ableness of God or his ability to perform miracles is never in question. And as I said before, you often hear people say, won't he do it? But others become disgruntled with God and even walk away from him when he doesn't do it for them. Let me ask you a question. What are the names of the three Hebrew boys? Most people know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, but that was not their names. That was not the names, their God-given names. And you will find that in Daniel, the first chapter, the sixth and the seventh verse. Let me tell you what their real names were. <clears throat> their names were... Uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But the king changed Daniel's name to Belteshazzar. Daniel's name means God is my judge, but the king changed his name uh, to the idol god Baal favors. So walk, walk with me now. Hananiah's name was changed to Shadrach. Hananiah means God favors me, but Shadrach means royalty. Mishael was changed to Meshach, and his name means I am who God says I am. 
But the king said, your name going to be Meshach, meaning guest of the king. And Azariah, his name means God is my help. His name was changed to Abednego, servant, meaning servant of Nebo, who is the idol god of wisdom. Let me tell you something. Names mean something. And the Hebrew word for name means reputation, fame, or glory. And so when, 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 when someone talks about the name of God, they're talking about his fame, his reputation, his glory. When someone wants to change uh, one's name or name their child, they're, they're, they're looking forward into the future on what the reputation or the fame of that child would be. So it's very important on what we and who we name and how we name. But when the king renamed these men, let me just say this. What others think of you is not what matters. What matters is that God knows who you are. Are y'all with me? Now watch this. Don't let the enemy change your name because you're in an unfamiliar place. Know who you are and stand on who God says you are. Watch this. Don't let the season you're in be what defines you. <laughs> I am who God says I am, not what you think I am. And so these three Hebrew boys say, King, we ain't bowing to your idol gods. I don't care what you name us. God is able, but even if he doesn't, we ain't going to get no attitude. We still gonna bow. We still gonna bow to the Lord of Glory. Are y'all with me? And then here go King David. What do you do if you pray for your baby to live, but the baby dies? Second Samuel 12, 16, 18, 20, 22. <clears throat> And you can read the full story if you like, but I, I just want to grab these verses so you can get a context. The Bible says in the 16th verse, David begged God to spare the child. David started, he went on a fast and he went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. But then on the seventh day, the child died. David's advisors were afraid to tell him he wouldn't listen to reason while the child was ill, they said. What drastic thing will he do when we tell him the child is dead? But then when David found out his baby didn't live, he got up from the ground. Now you got to understand, now he was fasting for seven days. That means he wasn't taking no showers. That means he was wearing the same clothes. So David, though he was in the presence of, the, of God physically, he stinketh. But the 20th verse says he washed himself. He put on some lotions and changed his clothes. And he didn't just go home and, and have a pity party. The Bible says he still went to the tabernacle and worshiped the Lord. After that, he returned to the palace and was served food and he ate. 22nd verse said, David replied, I fasted, I wept while the child was alive. For I said, perhaps, I don't know what the will of God is, but perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. So we should pray and we should trust God. Now, these are hard stories in Scripture because these are the stories people don't want to relate to because we want to run to the won't he do it stories. But quite often, and I run into people often that are disgruntled with God and turn their back on God or don't want to worship or come to church anymore because they said, I fasted about a situation, I prayed about a situation, and God didn't move. King David's baby got sick and he fasted for seven days. But then afterwards he washed himself. Let me just say it this way. You're not a true worshiper unless you can worship God 
if he doesn't answer your prayers. I know I ain't going to get a few amens, but today. Now I'm going to take you to our main text, which is Paul prayed three times. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Uh, and let me just set it up. Right before this, you will find that uh, Paul, whether he was uh, awake or asleep, he does not know. And he said, such a one was caught up into paradise. Paradise is another terminology for the third heavens or the heavens where God abodes or where he lives or the place where the righteous dead goes. It's another term for that called paradise. And Paul said, I was caught up there and I heard unspeakable revelations. But then here's the seventh verse of 2 Corinthians 12. He said, even though I receive such wonderful revelations from God, imagine being caught up to the place where we all eventually going to go or end up, at least I hope if you're a believer in Jesus. Imagine seeing what you see. Imagine hearing what you hear and then all of a sudden kind of coming back to earth he said, because I received such revelations from God, and so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Paul was caught up into heaven and, 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 and sometimes, watch this, God rewards us with difficulties to keep us from detouring from him. Paul was given a thorn and this thorn is a physical ailment or disability that most theologians would say or agree with because that's what it means in the Greek. Some kind of ailment, some kind of situation that Paul did not want in his life became a thorn in his side. And then it wasn't an angel from God that was sent to him, but a messenger of Satan, a demon to torment him. Oh, that's, that boggles my mind sometimes. But what do you do when you expect deliverance but get a demon? Understand this, that the kingdom of darkness serves at the pleasure of God. That the devil is a dog on a leash. He can't do whatever he want to do. He don't have that kind of power. The Bible says that we have power over all the power of the enemy. Is that what he said? Because the, two, the, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, the demons are subject to us. We was able to cast them out. And you know what? It's exciting to know that we got that kind of authority. And Jesus wasn't excited with them. He just said, listen, I beheld Satan falling as lightning. It's not, don't, don't worry about the fact that you have power over the enemy. That comes with you walking with me. That comes with you being with me. We have power over over the enemy but what you should be rejoicing about is that your name has been written in the book that your name is written in the book but here's the thing it's better to have problems than to be lifted up in pride watch this follow me the only other place in scripture the Greek word for pride was used <clears throat> that word was used was in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, and it, it was talking about Satan promoting himself as God in the place of worship. Are you with me? And so the same word, the same word that people use to, 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 to call out a, uh, pride is the same thing that God would God uses to bring us out. Pride is the worst of sins because you can have it and not know it. It's worse than adultery. 
It's worse than lying or any other sin because it's the one sin that Satan is filled with. Because he said, I'm going to be better than God. I'm going to be like God. I'm, I'm, I want people to worship me. And that kind of pride is what God was trying to protect Paul from when he got, saw all those revelations. And so he said, I'll, I'm going to send the messenger of Satan to buffet him so that he won't get lifted up so that he can stay humble. Because many times our problems are a result, sometimes, of our own choices. We can't blame God for results our choices got us. Bishop Dale Bronner said, when we are born, we look like our parents, but when we die, we look like our choices. <laughs> when we born, we look like our parents, but when we die, we look like our choices. And sometimes we need thorns to thirst us. We pray more when we are pained more. There is no other time that we seek God than when we're going through trials and tribulations. And when you go through situations in your life, that's when we should run to Jesus. That's when we should run to him. Even though the enemy may come in like a flood, the name of the Lord shall raise a standard against the enemy. And if the enemy has come, God is only using him to develop his glory in you. Can I tell you something? God is not as concerned about your comfort as he is your character. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 11, Paul says, but even now we go hungry and thirsty and we don't have enough clothes to keep warm. We are often beaten and have no home. Here is the great apostle saying, we hungry sometimes. We go thirsty. I don't even have enough clothes to keep warm. And, and I've been beaten. And then sometimes he said, I find myself homeless. But here he is, the apostle of God. Can I tell you something? Just because we are servants of God doesn't mean things are going to be peaceful all the time. But watch this. If you can walk away from worship because of your worst, your faith is rooted in God's performance and not his presence. I'll say that again. If you can walk away from worship because of your worst, your faith is rooted in God's performance and not his presence. The worship teams were singing at the end, his presence is what? Heaven to me. Pastor David Jacques, our lead pastor a few weeks ago, said, God did not promise us miracles. He promised us his presence. Prosperity is not having plenty. Prosperity is having his presence. When you have the presence of God, no matter what the enemy does, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what the doctor says, no matter what's going on with your children, no matter what's going on at the workplace, no matter if you've received furlough, don't, no matter what's happening in your life, in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And listen, when the enemy comes in, because he came to Jesus. God allowed the enemy to come to Jesus and to try to buffet him when Jesus started his ministry and, 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 and was trying to get him to turn rocks into food and to try to uh, uh, gain glory before his time and all of that. And Jesus would always say, it is written. Always run to the word when the enemy comes in. Because when the enemy comes in, it doesn't mean that, that, that you're not saved. It just mean that God wants to build you up and God will use the enemy to do it. <laughs> Paul said, this thorn uh, in my side, I'm going to pray about it. And the Bible says in the eighth verse, he said, three times I begged the Lord to take it away. How many times have you prayed and you prayed 
You prayed and prayed and things don't move in the direction that you want it to go. I said three times I prayed. But watch this. God doesn't respond the way we want him to. He responds the way he wants to. Like King David and Paul, we should pray. God, I want you to deliver. I want you to, to, to deliver me. I want you to help me. I want you to take this thing away. I remember when I first heard the big C word called cancer. I was at a restaurant downtown waiting to have lunch with a friend, a pastor friend. And while I was waiting, I get this call and I saw that it was the doctor's office and I expected to hear the receptionist, uh, but it was the doctor. How many of you know the doctors don't call nobody? If your doctor is calling you, him or herself, brace yourself, it, it, it ain't gonna, might not be a good day for you. And he just came out with it. He said, David, your blood work came back and um, your, high blood, your, your white blood cell counts are going higher and um, it could either be infection or cancer. And the moment he said cancer, I froze and started shaking. I, cancer is for other people, it ain't even for me. And you know what he said? He said, I want you to go, this was a Thursday, he said, I want you to go Friday, the next day, and get your blood work done. But I didn't go. I'll tell you what I did. I decided to wait three days to pray. I prayed three days, and my prayer was, Lord, heal me, whatever's going on in this old body. Heal your servant, but God, if you choose not to do it that way, then whatever journey I am about to go on, just be with me. Give me strength and give me peace. I just prayed three days. And then after three days, I went and got my blood work done. And guess what? Instead of things getting better, it got worse. My, my numbers were going higher. And then I went to a hematologist and they were going higher. And everything else was checking out. I checked off everything in terms of health. Check, 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 check. But when it came to the blood, it was no check mark. And the doctors were astounded. And so they did a bone marrow biopsy and went through my, the, my back, uh, my spine or something. All I know was it hurt. And when I got the results, it said that you had this form of leukemia and you need to take medication for it. By that time, God had given me peace. He didn't take it away, but it became this thorn, and it's still a thorn. I got my morning pills in my pocket now. When I sit on my seat, I'm going to take it. When I sit down at my seat, I have to take it twice a day. And I say, Lord, you are able to deliver me, but even if you don't, if I got to have this thorn in my side and it can bring you glory and it can bring encouragement to people to let them know that when you go through, you can still preach. When you go through, you can still sing. Where you at, worship leader? Well, I ain't singing right now because, listen, I'm just going through. That's the time you should worship the most. That's the time when you should praise him the most. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him for what is done no matter what happens in your life praise ye the Lord let everything that have breath I had a child that was some years ago locked up and they didn't want to give him bail my prayer to the Lord was I said Lord I don't know what's going on I don't know his guilt or his innocence but I said, Lord, let your grace, this is my prayer. I said, Lord, let your grace and mercy kiss the face of justice. And whatever the outcome is, God will give you praise. 
And 10 days went by, 20 days went by, 30 days went by. Next thing you know, there was a knock on the door and that was our son being had been released from, uh, from jail and they had dropped all the charges and case was closed. And I, I still don't want to know no details. I just know that God is able. Oh, but even if he don't, my worship is not contingent upon if God do it for me. Because God, you don't have to do another thing for me. When you got up on the cross and shed your blood and took some nails in your hand, nails in your feet. And when they put a, a crown of thorns on your head and when they pierced you in your side. And with the blood of Jesus, I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm Holy Ghost filled and I'm fire baptized. God is my witness. I worship me. If God said I'm done, I'm done doing for you. I'll be like, God, you done enough. Because everything God is doing for me now is a bonus. I got a wife who loved me and been with me for 33 years and she's eating my cooking now. That's a bonus. I'm dusting and cleaning and she ain't inspecting my work and say you missed a spot so she's enjoying my cleaning. That's a bonus. My children are well. That's a bonus. My children's businesses are thriving. That's a bonus. I got seven grandchildren. Thank God for them. They were born healthy and good. That's a bonus. That's a bonus. Oh yeah, no, the Lord didn't raise my mama up, broke my heart. We prayed and prayed and prayed and, and she still went on to glory. But even that's a bonus because for us to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. It's all about perspective. God, you've done. Now, don't get me wrong. I want God to do more. But if he don't do more, what am I going to do? Start tripping? I ain't coming to church no more because I done, I done did that fasting thing. I done fasted. I done got on the altar and I done even slobbered a few times. And you know what? Uh, ain't nothing happening for me. Let me tell you something. Even if he don't. Watch this. Prayer doesn't police God to perform for us. Prayer gets us in his presence to posture and perfect us. Let me say that again. Prayer don't please God because see, we pray with the expectation that God's gonna do what I told him to do. You don't tell God nothing. We ask. And if it be in his will, <laughs> prayer gets us into his presence to posture and perfect us. My praying for three days postured me for what's to come. And do you know, strangely enough, I'm grateful to be going through this journey of cancer. Not and from this perspective, because there is always somebody when I talk to or minister places and tell my story, they'll come up to me with tears in their eyes and said, thank you for that message that so encouraged me because I'm going through this, that, or the other, and your testimony has got me through. Can I tell you something? What you've gone through or going through is not just for you. It's for you to learn who God is so that you can help somebody else that he brings to your attention. Huh. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So can I tell you something? Prayer didn't change my situation, but it did change me. 
You know, prayer changes things. It does. But in case things don't go the way I think they should go, prayer will always change you. So never stop praying. The ninth verse says, each time it said, when God wanted to respond to Paul, after Paul prayed, God, will you take it from me, God? Pray, take it from me, God, take it from me. I'm tired of this, God. Please take it from me. And the Bible says he prayed three times, and God's response was, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. <laughs> grace, that is the God's divine influence on my heart. Joy, favor. It, it, it gives us the word charisma because it's the Greek word charis. It means the ability to draw someone to yourself. In other words, God's grace is being favored with his presence. Oh, watch this. Favor is not riches. It's righteousness. Favor is not income. It's God's influence on your mind. Favor is not happiness. It's heaviness. Oh, let me say that again. Favor is not happiness. It's heaviness. God's not concerned how happy you are. He's more concerned about how heavy you are. How much of him is in you because the word glory means heaviness. How much do you weigh with the glory of God? When you're heavy, you're unmovable. When you're heavy, you can't be swayed. When you're heavy, you don't move through the storms of life. When you're heavy, you can testify, won't he do it? And then you can say, but what if he doesn't? When you're heavy, God don't have to do it for me. I just need to know he's able to do it. But even if he doesn't, I'm not going to stop praising him. I'm not going to stop loving him, serving him, blessing him. God's grace is all that I need. Can somebody say amen? God's grace is all that I need. Why? Tenth verse, last verse. Because Paul said, I take pleasure in my weaknesses. And when I'm insulted in hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So you know what Paul is saying? Bring it on, baby. I can take it. I know my Redeemer lives. God can, but what if he doesn't? God can heal, but what if he doesn't? God can bless me with a job, but what if he doesn't right now? God can, can I tell you something? I heard something from uh, a banker and they told me this. We, we were looking at start, uh, opening up a bank account and they told me that um, I know this is a pandemic year, but this year, so many new businesses have opened. So many individuals have taken a faith uh, leap to start their own companies. And I said, wow. And I'm saying, wow, sometimes you have to get fired into purpose. Sometimes, let me tell you something. Uh, I started my company six and a half years ago because the, the organization I was working for moved me from full-time to part-time and I got angry and I said, how in the world I'm going to support my family on half a salary? And God spoke to me and said, Rem I re remember, I told you you, you you needed to go part-time. He did a few months before. And when I was in that boardroom as they were going through, hey, we, here's your assessment of your work. You've done good, check mark, check mark. You've done everything you need to do, but... Your role is about to change, and we're going to make you part-time. Man, I got Tangelo mad. That's where I'm from, Tangelo Park. Oh, then. You might say I'm Miami mad or Popka mad or New York mad or whatever mad. And then God reminded me 30 seconds later, remember I told you this was coming. 
And then I looked at them and smiled and said, I agree with your assessment. I'll take it. But when I agreed, God brought peace. True story, true story. Not long after that, two individuals that I knew, know very well, heard about my situation. And each of them, not knowing what the other one gave, my wife is my witness. Each one of them gave me a $10,000 gift. And that $20,000 helped carry me for a year in a part-time situation. It didn't, it didn't fully um, uh, uh, augment what I lost, but it was enough to get us through. And by the time it came to an end, that's when God gave me the vision to start the company. And now, six and a half years later, I was just able to award the biggest Christmas bonus to my employees I've ever been able to do. Last few years have been tough. God can do it. But what if he doesn't? God can cause my business to prosper. But what if he doesn't? God can let my loved one be healed. But what if he doesn't? God's grace is enough. Satan, I don't care what you're doing because whatever you're trying to do, God is using you for his glory. So I'm... I'm not worried about demons and what the devil does because the devil is the least of my worries. My biggest enemy is my inner me. That's my biggest enemy is myself. Because the Bible said where there's good, evil is always present. But then he said if you resist the devil, he'll flee. So how can the enemy flee but evil is always present? The evil that's always present is the evil part of our carnality that never leaves us. But if you walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, then Satan, I don't care what you're doing, whatever you're trying to do, whatever you want to do with my family, I have victory in Jesus so that no matter what, even if God does it, God is able. Can somebody say God is able? God is able. God is able. Pray to him because God is able. He can heal you. He can deliver you. Somebody said there's power in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's salvation in the name of Jesus. Demons tremble at the sound of that name. Amen. Jesus, he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is able. But even if he doesn't, not going to bow. Dave, you need the Lord. You want Jesus. If you want to be saved, if you want to be delivered, if you want to be set free, the blood of Jesus is always available for salvation if you want to commit your life to the Lord if you need prayer because you're struggling with your faith your faith is in a crisis because God don't seem to be listening if God let Paul pray three times and didn't change his situation, who are you? Well, I ain't Paul. Well, let's talk about his own son, Jesus. Jesus went to Gethsemane and prayed three times that the Father would take the cup from him. Did the Father answer him? Not a word. Didn't say a word to him. Jesus came back and finally the last time he said, nevertheless, not my will your will be done in other words Jesus said father you don't even have to take the cup from me I came here for the cup I came here to die but let your will be done the enemy thought he had victory but what the enemy didn't know that God used the cross to give us victory so when the enemy thinks he got you because he was given permission to come put a thorn in you next thing you know your greatest praise comes your greatest worship come. 
You say, Satan, you should have never messed with me because I'm going to write another song. I'm going to preach another message. I'm going to help somebody else get saved. Amen, somebody. If you want to be saved, text the word Jesus. Text the name Jesus. The 407-449-8884. If you want prayer because you've lost hope and faith because you believe God is not listening or because your worst situation happened after you fasted and prayed like David did and you just want encouragement, text the name Jesus to 407-449-8884. Father, I pray for those who are watching, for those who are listening, I pray, God, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart has been acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength, my redeemer. I pray, God, that the accuracy of your word was displayed responsibly. And should I need your correction, Give it to me, Holy Spirit, because never do I want to say anything that goes against your word because your word is truth and the words you speak to us are spirit and life. Save those that are lost. Deliver those that are bound. Set free the captives. And bless, forever bless, kingdom church and the people of God all over this world if you believe God and if you know he's able but even if he don't kind of a saint would you clap your hands and say praise the Lord God bless you and God keep you is my prayer